I've never lost my fascination with honeybees. I've had more downs than I've had ups with beekeeping and with honeybees. But it's at a point now where I enjoy it so much, no matter what goes bad, no matter what, how much down there is, like, oh no, look at that hive. Um, I love it. They say that about 80% of new beginners burn out and quit their first year. Let's go out to the bee yard, I'll show you why. Now, 80% seems like a lot, but on the other hand, you know, 80% of people quitting any hobby is not all that uncommon. You see a lot of things in the beginning and you think it's gonna be a lot of fun, there's gonna be a lot of excitement, and then you get into the, you know, nitty gritty, heavy duty, hard work, and uh, things to know about your hobby, and it does become frustrating. So today, I'm gonna to tell you more about why I think about 80% of new beginners quit their first year as we open up a hive and you'll kind of start to understand and we'll talk more about it. Look at this hive, it's almost as tall as I am. And what we're gonna to do today is actually take one of these supers off, give it to a hive over there because that hive over there needs a little more food and resources for winter. And so on this hive, we got two deeps and three supers. So uh, the beekeeper has to do things like this. Balance out your hives, keep them alive, move frames around, move boxes around. And so today we're gonna to have to look at this top super here, and we're gonna see if there's enough resources in here to leave it or take it. So if there's not, you know, if it's not all filled up, not a lot of nectar or honey, it doesn't have to be capped over because we're giving it to another hive, but we need to make sure one of these is gonna be enough for this hive and one for the other. Gotta do work like that. I don't know, maybe beekeepers don't like wearing big heavy bee suits on really hot days like today. That could be one reason. And I'm really glad to put this on because the noceum bugs are just eating me up. I need some protection. So it's October the 2nd. I always like to put on my bee gloves in fall because you never know what the temperament of the bee is gonna be like before we open them up. Bobblehead David says, be sure and subscribe before we open this up. Well, they ate those two big containers of sugar water. That's done. So I like to feed my bees this time of the year to keep them laying brood. But usually what happens is um, sometimes I can get a little bit behind on keeping them fed the way they should be. And um, it happens that they maybe don't lay as much brood because I'm not feeding them in the fall like I should be. They'll back down on uh, laying in the fall if, you, if they just don't have any resources, of course. I don't think bees should be blamed for the reason a lot of people quit beekeeping. I do think that a lot of media sources show beekeeping as a you know, perfect, great hobby that has no problems. And people start into it, and then all at once they realize, oh boy, I've got issues. Now that's just one big frame of nectar and pollen. So let's look at the pollen. Yeah, look at the yellow pollen, probably goldenrod pollen up in the corners here. It's a good sign that they've got some good nutrition, but what we're looking for today to get these bees through the winter is to make sure they have, you know, some frames of brood. I often ask myself, how come I never gave up beekeeping? I started beekeeping with one hive, and then I expanded into two, and I ran two for quite a while when I just started. And it really wasn't doing much for me as far as just, you know, I mean, I had fun doing it, but I didn't really know much about it. 
I remember the first year I started beekeeping, I actually produced so much honey. I lived in Ohio and I lived in an Amish community. I wasn't Amish, but our house was near there. And they just had fields and fields of clover for the cattle and horses and things. And I just had so much honey that was unbearable. Now that's a good brood pattern. For those of you that are beekeepers, you see that and you go, wow, yeah. Those are all bees of winter physiology. When those bees emerge, they'll be uh, living into April and May. So I'm always glad to see that and on both sides. So I've been feeding them from the top, my one-to-one -one sugar water with my additives to prompt them to lay more brood even this time of the year. A lot of times bees naturally back away from much brood production as the days get shorter and the nectar supply gets less. Mm. Yep, and so you can see this good brood pattern, solid brood pattern on both sides. And I can see it's on the next one too. And what I really want to see is between four to six frames of brood just like that, uh, especially this time of year. I think that's crucial. This is the 1st of October, about October the 2nd or 3rd, I think. And uh, so in Illinois, this is about when we're going to start getting a hard freeze. Any, any day now is possible, although the temperature is hot. It's 80, 88 degrees right now. But our first freeze occurs usually in early October, first frost. So this is the time of the year where bees are pretty much done. And now they need to have some resources on board as well as good brood in here. So since this hive doesn't have a honey super, we're going to grab one off the tall hive that has three honey supers and give this hive a little more food. Now, if you're wondering why this hive has straps on them, it's only because I moved it up here from my other apiary when I moved things around. And if I, I've just never uh, taken it off. I mean, I've had it open, but every time I mow, I have to throw it somewhere. So I just throw it and reconnect it to keep the mower from getting into it. But so this is a strong hive, two deep hive bodies, one, two, three honey supers. So we're going to see if this hive can live without one of their honey supers. Obviously they can. I can harvest all this honey, but I'm not really in so much of a honey business that I need to do that. Oh, I remember now I did take a frame out of there. Oh, look at that. I was in a hurry one day making a YouTube video and I took a frame out and I failed to put a frame back in. And look what they did. Although it's not impressive, I remember that's been probably a month ago. And that's all the more that they built out after about a month. So anytime you disrespect bee space like that, you make a, make a, uh, you maybe forget or something, look what the bees will do. They will build comb and put it right where the frame would have been. It's not a very big piece and they've connected it down through there to the bottom, I think. Let me get on the other side so you can see it. Yeah, there we go. So we'll have to put a frame in here to compensate for that. Now this piece, you don't want to just throw it in your bee yard. That's sometimes what will attract small hive beetles. But that's a good example of why you never want to leave a frame out. That's, we got lucky they just made a little piece of comb there. Now while we're in this section right here, let me blow some smoke down in here. There's still a little piece down in there. I don't want to hurt any bees. But you can use your hive tool to kind of uh, correct this, move things around a little bit. Yeah. But I want to show you this frame right here. What we'll probably do is go ahead and move this frame to the hive that needs a super. And we're going to make sure the queen's not up here. We don't want to, we don't want to move our queen. I'm not using a queen excluder on this hive right now. And usually when you have three honey supers on here like this, the queen is rarely down are rarely up in those supers. So I'm not using a queen, I'm not using a queen excluder here, so it's it would be rare for her to be up in here. 
And as you can see, that's just nice capped over honey. You might say, David, why don't you just take that and harvest it? Well, I could, but I really don't need, I've got, I don't sell honey um, anymore. I used to make a living on honey, but now I just make enough honey for myself. So the extra honey that bees make, I leave it for them or I do things like this. Instead of harvesting two supers and leaving them one, I just take this top honey super off and give it to a hive that needs a little push, needs a little help. Look at that, that's great, isn't it? Okay, so the queen's not up here because that's the middle frame. But what we do need to do is push all of these frames over toward, uh, so we don't want a space in the middle because they're gonna go up here in the winter time. By giving this super to the other hive that needs one, What's going to happen in the winter, even though I'm feeding them my winter bee kinds, they're still going to go all the way up here and start eating this food. And so I'm pushing all the food over here. And then I'm just going to lay one extra frame over toward the edge because they won't likely be at the edge. All right, so we have a frame over here that's going to fill that gap. All right, so let's get ready and go ahead and just move this over there. Then we'll take a look at the super below and double check it. All right, let's get this top off. A lot of bees in there. I don't have too far to walk, but let's smoke the bees, uh, get them down a little bit before we put that new super on there. <clears throat> That's a little bit heavy. Wow, look at that, spreading the wealth. <laughs> Isn't that great? We actually, uh, help this hive out a lot. Even though I'm going to feed them in the winter time with my winter bee kind, it's going to be so nice that they have a whole super on top. Again, I have the freedom to do that because I'm not trying to make a living on honey. This is just my way of trying to equalize my hives out. Yeah, look at this hive. This is the hive that just keeps on giving. Let's see what this super looks like. So, top super, all capped over, look beautiful. And guess what this one's going to look like? Leave a comment below if you think you already know, but let's pull this one out here. I already know it's gonna be just overflowing with capped over honey. Yeah, I haven't taken any honey off of this hive and it's pretty common amount of honey for bees to make for me here in central Illinois is about three to four supers a year. And look at that very dark in it. Uh, that's dark for several reasons, but primarily um, it's just simply dark because of the nectar that's in there and it's been in there a bit. But I want to look at the next one beside it too. All, it's all dark. I may be tempted to actually harvest this. <laughs> I love to get some dark honey. Uh, there's farmers around here that grow some buckwheat, stuff like that, and my bees find that and they make some buckwheat honey. And uh, boy, it can, that stuff is like molasses. And if you've never had it, it's got a real uh, peculiar taste to it as well. I love it. It's got a robust flavor to it. Yeah, that's pretty dark honey for sure. Look at that. Yep, it's all that way. Well, I'm going to have to harvest this. So I, I changed my mind. That's one thing cool about beekeeping. You know, you see something, you're like, eh. So by harvesting the top super, what's going to happen is they're going to have the bottom super uh, that's below this one, they'll have that for winter. So that'd be my little uh, gift for working my bees, keeping them healthy. Uh, they'll give me back one of these since they have three. Plus, the other thing about this is I don't want to overwinter with two supers on because that makes a big space for them to heat. I don't want to overwinter with two supers. So we'll take this one off. So beekeeping has a pretty strong learning curve to it. I think that's why a lot of people quit. It seems like at times you really wouldn't have to know that much about beekeeping. You know, what do you do? Throw bees in a box and, you know, they make honey. So all at once you throw bees in a box and you start getting nervous and you start thinking, well, I don't know if I have a queen or not. And I'm not sure if I got enough brood. Oh, I, I don't understand beekeeping as much as I thought I did. And, and at that point, it's hard to stop what you're doing and all at once start learning because you're in the middle of beekeeping. And then like today, you know, it's 86 degrees out here 
And a lot of beekeepers, like when I first started, I just accidentally started expanding. I wasn't trying to expand, but I caught a swarm and I caught another swarm. But one of the things that really kept me into beekeeping, that keep me from giving up when I got burned out, uh, I got too many hives on my hands, I couldn't keep track of it all, I couldn't keep a handle on everything. What really kept me going was the desire to learn more. It really was. There's a point when beekeepers quit because they look and see that they're not getting much return on their investment. They may have spent a lot of money on a vaporizer to cut down on mites. They may have spent a lot of money on equipment, a lot of hives, but then once they start losing some hives or you know, they just get into maybe a health concern, a sore back, they just can't keep investing money without getting some return for it. If it's a bad year, you don't get a lot of honey, all right, well, that's, that's bigger beekeepers, but why do smaller beekeepers, hobbyists, maybe with one or two hives, why do they quit after a year? I think a lot of times it is disillusionment. It really is. We, we started beekeeping thinking that we're gonna help pollinate the world, that our little hive in our little location is gonna pollinate all of our tomatoes, our strawberries, our, you know, our sweet peas, our corn, everything like that. We have this grandiose idea that we're saving the world on our little spot of the world. And we're gonna get honey to put on our kitchen table. And so every morning we'll have great vegetables that our bees help pollinate. And we'll have a great spoonful of honey to put on our toast that our bees made. And we'll have a little extra wax that we can make candles and read by candlelight at night next to the fire. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of being a little facetious, but I think there is a point in time when what you wanted it to be, it became something else. It became hard work. It became more attention. It became a requirement for you to know more, how to control mites, what chemical treatments to use. It became more than you were expecting. And all at once you feel like, you know what? I just can't give it the time. The, the, I'm not getting the enjoyment out of it that I thought that I would. And that's with any hobby, you know? Now, take it from a guy that has a lot of hobbies. Take it from a guy that has had a lot of hobbies that I've quit. And so I'm kind of scattered brain like that myself when it comes to hobbies. There's very few hobbies that I've started over the years that I'm still doing. Basically boils down the one that I can't tell you about. Another hobby is ham radio. I'm an amateur radio operator. Started that in 2020, I think three years ago. I love that. Um, but I do have the hobby of cycling. Now I've been a cyclist, uh, race, racing, cycle, cycling uh, bikes for uh, since I was in my 20s. And so I, I love bikes, I love riding bikes. I'm on the road so much pedaling and I love bikes. So I have some hobbies that I've kept over the years, but I've given up a lot. The main reason I haven't given up beekeeping is because I really feel that it's the one thing that really keeps me in tune with nature. It's physical, it's outdoors. It requires me to continue to learn, stretches my brain power. It stretches my ability to stay physically physically fit. I mean, I'm out biking, but picking up big heavy supers, bending over, stretching and all that. I could take a yoga class, but I could come out here. <laughs> I get my stretching in out here. And so it's one of the things that I, I really like in my life that can help me just be with nature, to enjoy the outdoors and just to watch bees and learn about them. It's fascinating. I've never lost my fascination with honeybees. I've had more downs than I've had ups with beekeeping and with honeybees. But it's at a point now where I enjoy it so much, no matter what goes bad, no matter what, how much down there is, like, oh no, look at that hive. Um, I love it. And it's a challenge. Every hive I open up, it's a challenge. Even if I look, open up a hive and I don't see what I wanted to, maybe the queen isn't there, she's not laying good, there's no brood, there's not enough food. I don't kick myself. I don't get all down in the mouth about it. It's a challenge. I'm like, okay, let's see what we can do. Um, are they raising a queen? If not, let's drop a new queen in there. Let's start feeding them. Let's see if we can get them built up for winter. That's going to be a challenge. It's going to be fun. And if we don't, hey, we tried. Not the end of the world. You know, that's my attitude about beekeeping. I know there's a lot of people that have a pretty 
straightforward approach to beekeeping. A lot of you watch beekeeping channels like mine and others, and you want to see one guy tell you one thing about bees, and you want to go out there and apply that and have the same results he does or she does. And it's not always that way. And if it fails, when you do everything they tell you to do and it still fails, that's the nature of the hobby. That's the nature of bees. They don't always respond the same every time. But you have to be able to say, you know what? What does it mean to me? It's a beehive. I did my best. I failed at it. Um, but I think it's important, like I've said on my live stream the other night, um, one of the mistakes that I made early on was I just had one hive. And that's not good. Now, fortunately, the mites had not really gotten a hold in the U.S. yet. That one mite, that one uh, hive lived a long time. And then the mites came. By that time, I had two and it wiped both of them out. So you got to understand that having a couple of hives, three hives, it's going to give you a better um, idea about honeybees and how bees react to things that you do with them or to them. One hive may not react. It may just be a real failing of a hive. I've, I've talked to many beekeepers who become real frustrated because they started with one hive and that one hive had a bad queen. They didn't know that. And it didn't lay good brood. They dwindled down all year long. They fed them. They did everything, but it just dwindled. It never took off. They didn't know to replace the queen and they quit beekeeping. And that's usually a lack of knowledge. So for me, increasing my knowledge of honeybees by pursuing the Master Beekeeper Program at uh, Eastern Apicultural Society was huge for me. And I strongly suggest that. Am I promoting just EAS over other Master Beekeeper programs? Yeah, <laughs> it does seem like that. No, I mean, they're all, there are some great programs, absolutely. I, but I am partial to EAS because of the way they carry out the testing. They don't train you, they simply test to see if you know as much as you say you do. And so the testing is very rigorous and you have to pass uh, written tests, an oral test before a committee of master beekeepers. You have to pass a written test and a lab test. And so the testing process is very intimidating uh, because it's all on the line. But that helped me because I knew that before I uh, tackled those four things in two days, that I had to learn as much, I had to learn everything I could on bees. And it doesn't mean I know everything. I think I've forgotten more than I've ever learned, but I, I, I just poured my life into understanding honeybees. And that's been very rewarding. It has kept me in the hobby or in, in beekeeping. And I really do enjoy learning more to this day. Every day I'm studying about bees, trying to soak up as much as I can. So let me say this to you. If you're at a place now where you feel like quitting, if you're one of the 80 percenters that probably think, Boy, it didn't go well this year. It's fall. I, I don't think my bees made much honey. This was a waste of my money. Um, don't give up just yet. Why don't you do this? How about spend the winter really learning about bees? Educate yourself about bees. Learn more. Um, pursue a master beekeeper program, perhaps. Start looking into it anyway and start studying for it. It's, it's uh, quite a feather in your cap to become a master beekeeper. It doesn't really mean anything. I mean, you know, Kent Williams always says, yeah, if you become a master beekeeper, it doesn't really give you much advantage when you go into uh, a restaurant, order a cup of coffee, it's still going to cost you the same amount of money if you're a master beekeeper or not. He has some saying like that. So, you know, it's not a lot of advantage uh, as far as being more skilled at beekeeping. You can have master beekeeper skill set in beekeeping and not be a master beekeeper. So don't think I'm saying that, but I'm just saying it would help you uh, study harder if you're if you were like me, you, there were some things you weren't wanting to learn about with bees, and that program forces you to know as much as you can. So you've got all winter now, if you really got sour about last year's beekeeping, you got all winter to learn more and kind of fall back in love with it and use the experience that you gained last year, put that into work next year, and it'll make you a better beekeeper. Now, if you're thinking about starting beekeeping and the so, uh, God, even though beekeeping has a lot of challenges, it's still a hoot. Check out my new, nope, let's try it again. Oop. 
Now, even though beekeeping can be challenging, it's still a hoot. If you're thinking about starting beekeeping in the spring, check out this video that I made for you guys, how to start beekeeping. It'd be great for you to learn over the winter. If you're going to start in the spring, this is the video to watch. I'll see you over there. Now I got to get back because I want to get out of this bee yard, get a bite to eat. See you later.